Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Peebles, Survey Statistician, Census Bureau Economic Management Division. Today, we have several subject matter experts from the State Department Director of Defense Trade Controls who will be discussing external licensing. We're happy to host the webinar today, and thank you all for joining. You will receive the transcript, presentation, and recording within about seven to 10 business days following the webinar, and those materials will be placed on the Census and the State Department website. We ask that you please submit your questions via the chat feature during the webinar to all panelists. We have a number of um, representatives from the State Department who will be monitoring the chat during the webinar. Also, we value your feedback, so please complete the evaluation form as it assists us in planning future content. So let's take a look at the next slide. Before we begin with the featured um, presentation, I would like to share a few resources from the Census Bureau to include the Global Market Finder, Trade Source Newsletter, and the Census Business Builder. So to begin, we have the Global Market Finder, which is a tool that will help users find detailed international trade in good statistics for specific commodity codes, countries of destination, and modes of transportation. When designing the tool, we targeted companies that are new to exporting or those that are already exporting but looking to expand their markets, as you can see by the red highlighted dots. We have a trade source newsletter, and I'm happy to say we have our federal partners that contribute to the newsletters to include the State Department, Bureau of Industry and Security, Small Business Administration, Export and Import Bank. So in the newsletter, we feature um, highlights from the various agency, as well as federal resources that can assist you in expanding your business operations globally and just increasing your business operations to help you to achieve compliance. And last, we have the Census Business Builder, which is a suite of services that provides selected demographic and economic data from the Census Bureau tailored to meet specific types of users in a simple to use access and format. The tool is useful for small businesses, owners who need key data for their businesses to help them plan um, and help them understand potential, potential markets, help them to create their business plans and understand their potential markets. And the tool has a number of easy um, features to include easy to use menus to search for tools for nearby business types, interactive and download report capability, as well as that is optimized for your smartphone or a tablet. Next slide, as we take a look at our International Trade Helpline, you can call this number and reach out to our representatives that can assist you with your export transactions once again to help you facilitate your export operations globally. Please visit the Census Academy site for future outreach events such as um, webinars and other training opportunities and take a look at our Census Trade podcast that details one of our tools, USA Trade Online. So just wanted to give you just a snapshot of some of our tools before the featured presentation and I'm going to pass it on to Renee. Thank you so much, Wendy, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, and also thank you to the US Census Bureau for hosting today's webinar on licensing licensing 2.0. Um, I am Renee Colores. I am on the IT modernization team um, at the US Department of State Directorate of Defense Trade Controls or DDTC. As many of you know, DDTC's main mission is ensuring commercial exports of defense articles and services, making sure that they advance U.S. Um, national security and foreign policy objectives. Today, we have some great speakers from DDTC. We have Karen Reggae, our Chief Information Officer, as well as Charlie Liebertrau and Chris Radcliffe from our IT modernization team, who will go over uh, licensing 2.0 um, and the demos. So if we want to move to the next slide, uh, we could do a quick overview of our agenda. So. Our team is going to walk through the goals, timeline, and impact of Licensing 2.0, as well as a demo of its functionality and usability. Uh, we'll also review DEC self-service. Um, and as Wendy mentioned, please, throughout the webinar, and write your questions, any questions you have um, in the chat box. We will be gathering those and making sure we leave enough time at the end for Q&A. Um, so I will now turn it over to Karen to go over the goals. Over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Renee. I really appreciate the introduction and 
Um, I'm so happy to be here. It's been a while. I, I haven't talked to most of you on this format um, for all of 2021 and all of 2022, I think. Um, so it has been a while and it's so good to be here and there's so many participants. I am just so excited um, to have you on here so we can talk a little bit about our continual effort to modernize the DEC system. Let's move slides. All right, so first I want to talk about, you know, why we're doing this, right? I mean, we did just deploy in um, March or February, actually, of 2020, right before the pandemic started. Um, and, and basically, we start out with, we had these goals um, for licensing 2.0. We were really interested in safeguarding the system while maintaining the agility. And, and we really wanted to bridge the gap. Um, between accessing the multiple systems to come up with really a frictionless, um, you know, experience for users. Um, we, we were also interested in migrating our external licensing user interface to a more common UI framework that's going to be across the DEX platform for all user um, experience and user interface um, for all the different applications. Um, and of course, we're all always looking for ways to streamline the user interaction um, through our online presence and, and for the external users. And what we're hoping um, to, to really get out of this is what, what I'm going to call the key tenets of our approach. You know, we, we want to enhance, always be enhancing the functionality. And this, this framework is going to allow us to do many of the things that we um, received from the DEX user group that probably many of you um, were a part of. You know, we, we wanted to establish the platform so that we could come up with some of those advanced features that you've been looking for. We wanted to have, um, the, the platform connection, you know, we have all these different best of breed tools. We want to make that more integrated. We want to, we want to be able to take um, this system and make sure that, you know, that everything is secure and that there's operability across all the different features and all the different applications in the system and that we can make changes quickly as the regulatory environment changes. So let's go on to the next slide. So um, basically, you know, our timeline for this product, um, we started building this application last year, um, you know, and that was in, in large part the recognition that what you were asking for, um, we, we didn't really have um, the right framework for all the things that you were hoping to get, um, you know, as, as part of that user group experience. And so, um, you know, in particular, you know, uh, we want to be set up to be able to allow um, third party users, for example, um, you know, to be able to streamline their experience on behalf of all their different customers. Um, likewise, we want to help international organizations to organize, for example, their their filings um, in, in such a way that they can go back to all the filings that their company has been part of, which, which really doesn't exist right now as non-registered entities. Um, and that's this first phase um, isn't going to take on those challenges, but we're going to be in a position where we'll be able to build off of this framework to be able to do some of those, um, those changes that um, people in the industry are looking for. So, as I said, we started last year and then we did um, uh, conduct industry user acceptance testing with our DEX user group earlier this year. Um, so we conducted it in early May. Um, we had 41 different users submitting over 75 test applications and they tested all aspects of the system, including something we didn't touch, which was batch filing, um, that, you know, making sure that that still worked. We tested track status, access groups, and we received a lot of valuable feedback, not all of which is going to be part of the deployment, but many of the things um, will be part of that deployment. And now what we're planning is um, a release of, of 2.0, and that's, um, it says here in this slide, we plan to deploy in mid-June, and we do, um, and and we're, we're, we're doing a final go, no go this afternoon. So um, it would have been um, nice to have that yesterday, but as it turned out, um, it was scheduled for this afternoon. So um, we will 
come back out with uh, a web notice that identifies exactly what the outage will be, when it will be, and how it'll impact you for your planning purposes. Now, there's, I, I want to say that, you know, this is a this is a very different framework, but what you're going to really notice is not that many fundamental changes. And and um, Chris is going to really walk through a, a lot of the things that you'll see in the user interface. But a lot of the changes, um, you know, were with the platform itself, um, which will allow us to do, you know, versioning and 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 all sorts of other things that we really need to do um, to make the most robust system possible. So, so really, in terms of the impact to you, your previous submissions, um, all the prior submissions are going to be accessible with a PDF. So you'll click on it and you'll be able to download and print a PDF copy of it. So we're no longer going to be supporting the form view, which is really the view that you see when you're filling out the application. That was primarily the same view that you would see after the fact. Um, and and what we've decided is to replace that just with the PDF, a, a really little bit more official looking um, submission record so that you can do your record keeping requirements, um, have those files of what you've submitted and so on. Um, for the in progress submissions, so those are all going to be, of course, migrated to the new platform. So you're not going to lose anything that you put in um, in a as a in progress submission. So if you start working on a filing and licensing, don't finish it before we have our outage window and you want to pick it up um, after the outage window, you'll be able to do that. And you, you can finalize your submission in the 2.0 interface and there won't be any problems. And the beauty of this particular um, you know, iteration of DEX licensing is that there was no information collection changes as part of this. So, so all the data is going to be the same that you're going to be submitting in um, through the, the 2.0 interface. And then in terms of future submissions, um, you know, you're going to submit licenses as normal. You're still going to be able to make use of um, batch filing or interactive filing. Um, you'll notice a little bit of differences in terms of the look and feel. And then, of course, once you submit your application, um, you're going to be able to access the submission um, with a PDF and be able to view, save, print, um, you know, keep within your records. So not a lot, um, but but it is a significant change um, in terms of the platform itself, and and that's why I'm here because I because I, I want to give some context as to as to why we're doing this and and what the what the future line benefits will be of of being on this new platform. And now I'd like to introduce Chris Radcliffe, who is going to go through the external licensing 2.0 demo. And I'll be back a little later on for the Q&A. Thanks, Karen. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and run through uh, that some of the changes of the licensing 2.0 um, environment. And, and like Karen said, a lot of what we're going to see today is going to feel and see uh, seem very familiar. Um, that's because a lot of the changes that are being made are back end and are going to allow us to propel forward and kind of makes a lot of those adjustments, a lot of the uh, recommendations that we've received from the DEX user group possible in the future. Um, however, today we did want to show you uh, that any changes to the system, what things look like, any things that you might see that look different from uh, from the prior licensing deployment. Um, so let's go let's go ahead and start running through a few slides. First off, uh, we now see that we're on the industry service portal homepage. This should look relatively familiar to a lot of uh, Dex users, uh, something that you probably see every time you log into Dex. Um, and just to let you know, um, while we're going through these slides. Um, I do want uh, I do want to make everyone aware that this is a test environment. So we're going to be looking at the standard company with a user. Her name is Jane Doe. Uh, this is all test information that we've made for the purposes of this demo. Um, so just know that nothing here is in production, and uh, and this is all in the test environment. Uh, awesome. And so to move forward into licensing, uh, we first always start off by clicking applications, the application drop down menu, and click on licensing to get to that home page. 
Once we do so, uh, you'll see a couple changes right off the bat. Um, nothing, nothing groundbreaking, but what it is is it's uh, it's a lot. It's it's for better usability and for um, and for for user functionality purposes. So at the top, you see on the applications uh, navigation bar above where it says industry service portal, the applications drop down, learning tools section, and even the user up in the top right, we've gone ahead and bolded all of that text. Um, something that, a theme that we're going to see throughout the licensing 2.0 um, changes are that um, are that we we wanted to make things stand out a bit more for users. And, uh, and, and judging by on how other online systems work with buttons and whatnot. We want to kind of continue that theme throughout the licensing application to uh, to, to add this type of contrast when users are using the system and, uh, and are, are looking at different things that they can click on and interact with. So we've bolded all of that text. And then you'll see uh, the backdrop for DEX licensing. Uh, we've gone ahead and made that shade darker in addition to the uh, different features within licensing, like track status, batch submission, um, this color scheme is going to kind of be reflected throughout the entire change in licensing 2.0. Navigating down to the in progress application section, uh, we have the new licensing form and refresh buttons. Uh, those buttons do now look different uh, than the licensing 1.0 release. Uh, however, those are uh, they function the same way and um, and we've gone ahead and added an icon next to the new licensing form to help reflect exactly what button it is you're clicking. Uh, so you'll see those buttons and that kind of color theme and schema throughout the rest of licensing 2.0's uh, demo today. Uh, you'll also notice uh, that the icons in the in progress uh, application section. So if we look down where there's the DSP5, there's a sample draft license there. Uh, you'll notice the icons off to the right. We have the uh, the trash bin and the um, and the two pages overlaid on one another. Uh, those features existed in licensing 1.0. However, we've changed the icons to just have a bit more contrast so that users can click on that icon and, and the icon itself is now the uh, the interactable button versus before when we had a small square that bordered it. Um, it's, it's kind of that look, the, uh, the sleek look and feel that we're going for with licensing 2.0. And in the future, of course, this is the basis of what things will be based off of in the future. Um, we'll be adding new, uh, new updates and enhancements, but this is kind of the, the framework for how we're going to be doing that. So if we go ahead, we're gonna now uh, look at some of the features within licensing. Um, we'll go ahead and start on track status where we see that the the columns for uh, for clicking your licenses that have been submitted or are in review with DDTC, those column uh, headings are still the same. And we notice that we have that copy icon feature uh, from the first page of the licensing homepage still there. And, and we're kind of standardizing these icons and, and features, um, sorry, changes in the features like the refresh button, for instance, we're standardizing that throughout the licensing application. Um, one of the next changes that comes within track status is if we go ahead and expand the filter criteria bar, we've changed around some of the fields on this page. Uh, so what we did was we, we realized that, um, that we've been telling users, you know, keep your case number handy with you when you're trying to search for licenses within the system. We've gone ahead and moved the case number up so that it's the first thing users see and, and it's the first field that users are, are drawn to when they're trying to search for licenses. And then if you go ahead and click on the date fields, oh, well, first off, you'll notice that we've moved the date fields to, uh, to mirror one another. For instance, the date submitted from and the date submitted to are on the same line, kind of helping users with, uh, with, with that level I line, knowing like, oh, okay, this is the date field that I'm going to enter my information to, and then go over to the right, that's the date field that I'm going to, the date range that I'm going to be selecting from. So if we go ahead and expand it, um, this should look relatively similar to other date and calendar functions uh, in other systems, but we've gone ahead and kind of squared everything off, made it a little bit more sleek, um, just following that UI design for licensing 2.0 in general. And then if we move forward, um, moving forward into the access groups feature of licensing, uh, you'll, you'll notice a couple things right off the bat. Um, so Next to the add group field, where you typically add the name of an access group and then click add to, to make a new access group, and it would show up down in the columns below. 
Uh, we've gone ahead and changed the add button to reflect the overarching licensing 2.0 sleep design. Uh, we also added an icon in the add button uh, to reflect the folder, and that folder icon is the same one that's on the, on the uh, main licensing homepage when you, when you navigate to access groups in general. So it's, it's standardizing the icons and the button usage for a lot of the features and applications that we have within licensing. Um, you'll also notice that down below uh, where the access groups live, uh, you'll see the default and blue group rows. Um, those are just two sample access groups we have here for the purposes of this demo. If you look over to the right, uh, you'll see that, that the icons um, are, have changed a bit to kind of reflect that overarching 2.0 uh, UI design. Um, the pencil icon will allow you to edit any access group that's on the same row as that, uh, as that icon. And then the trash bin is for the delete feature. Um, you'll see these icons standardized throughout the entire application, but we just want to point that out in case, uh, in case it looks a little different from, before, uh, from what you're used to when you're using the application before. So moving back over to the homepage of licensing, uh, let's dive into a in-progress license and see what's changed within the uh, individual forms themselves. Uh, we'll go ahead and start by clicking on the DSP-5. That's the one that we have queued up for today. <coughs> and, uh, and right off the bat, on the start block of this in-progress license, uh, there are a couple things we just wanted to note. Um, you'll see actually up at the top, uh, the save, validate, print, and exit features still exist. And so those are, those are the exact same features as we had before, um, and they function the same way. Um, those, were, those are really valuable tools within the licensing application, and we didn't want to tamper with those too much. Uh, so, so just know that those are still the features that work exactly the same in this uh, application. Um, but the first change on this homepage uh, is next to the transaction number. And it's a, uh, it's a small red icon um, that looks familiar probably because that indicates that it's a required field on the, uh, on the licensing form. Now, in the past, we've heard that users have maybe um, struggled a tiny bit with, uh, with identifying which fields are particularly required. Um, we've gone ahead and updated that icon to, to have a bit more contrast uh, in relation to the backdrop of the page, uh, so that users, it really stands out. When you look at the page, you'll see that it's a bright red circle uh, versus a more faint uh, red circle than we had before. Um, and that'll function the same way that if you try to progress through a block on the licensing form, it will, uh, it'll give you a, uh, it'll, it'll re refresh the page and, uh, and make you fill out any of the required fields as, um, as needed um, to continue through the licensing form. Uh, so that's that's the first change, uh, and that's standardized throughout all of the different forms. Um, the other one is actually one that I'm pretty excited to talk about, um, and it, it, it might at first not seem like a huge deal, um, but you'll see down below, here, I'll go ahead and expand that a little bit for you. Um, down below, that's the, uh, that's the help button. So in a lot of fields within the licensing form, um, users might struggle a bit and, and wonder what information needs to get put in any particular field. Um, so typically what you'll do is you'll hover your mouse over that help icon and a small bubble will pop up over top with some help text in it. Now, if you moved your mouse away from that button, the help text would disappear. We've gone ahead and changed it so that you hover your mouse over that help button, it'll let you know, click to display the help field. And then once you click your mouse button, it'll pop up help text on the field. Um, why is this useful? Well, so if you're, if you're on a licensing form and you need to navigate away to another browser tab or you're, uh, you need to pull up another application, you move your cursor and the help text field is gone. It might also be a little bit difficult to copy that help text if you're, if you're just hovering over the bubble and you don't lead your mouse directly up into that bubble field. Now we've changed it so that uh, there's more room for us to add additional help text um, for those more complicated fields and it makes it so that you have to click OK or out of the field in general to return back to the licensing form. That lets you sit there and, and really really uh, drinking that information. Uh, you can even copy the text and paste it in another Word document. Realistically, it's just a quality of life upgrade that we felt was a, was a good one to make with the iteration of the licensing 2.0 release. Uh, so moving forward, Still on the start block for the DSP-5 that we have open, uh, you'll notice that this is the section where you upload documents uh, to your license. Well, so we have a sample one uploaded right there. It's the letter of intent, and uh, we have an example file uploaded to, to um, accompany it. And you'll see off to the right that download button. Um, so we, 
there was an option to download before, but we just wanted to point out that there isn't a column header for it right there. However, that button does probably seem familiar to a lot of people as like a general, uh, generally accepted download button. Just wanted to point out that that's where it is, even though there's no column header that lets you know, hey, this is where you download your document to double check that it was the right one you up uploaded. And then, of course, uh, we, we've standardized the, uh, the icon there to remove the document. Um, and that and that's the same one that was on the uh, main licensing homepage, um, the track status, or sorry, the access groups page. Um, it's it's standardizing those icons kind of just throughout the application. The last minor thing to mention on this page is down below in the bottom right, um, the continue button, um, or or just moving forward through an application. Uh, it used to be that we had continue and back buttons on the, the right and left side, respectively, of each of the. Uh, of the licensing form pages. So now instead we've replaced it with forward arrows and uh, and back arrows. Um, if you hover over that arrow, you'll still get the text like I have down below that says continue. So it'll let you know that uh, that you know clicking that button will progress you through the form. And um, and just to remind everyone, it still does work that when you click forward and progress through the form, it'll do that auto generation of validating the fields on the form. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're as you're working through the application. It's uh, assuming everybody would see that and kind of attempt it themselves to see if that was the button, but just wanted to point it out ahead of time. Uh, the next change within the licensing form uh, is on block three. And this is something that uh, that's pretty interesting and, and I'm excited for. Um, it, it helps, it, it's, it's quality of life upgrade in these multi-select fields. So before it used to be a drop down where you'd have to search for the country by scrolling through a laundry list of countries we had there and then uh, selecting that country clicking add and that selects it right there we've streamlined it a bit uh, to make it so that there's an, a plus button next to the country and that automatically adds it to the right side to the selected items field um, but something else that's useful is instead of scrolling through the entire country list uh, we added filters like the unselected filter and selected filter fields um, that let you um, that let you pare down that list of countries into a, uh, a more manageable list. So for instance, if you started typing in A, for the uh, purposes of this demo, I typed in Afghanistan as the country that uh, that we'll search for here. Um, you'll notice that that, that that scroll wheel or that that list of countries um, has been narrowed down drastically. In fact, Afghanistan is the only selection of it available. And, um, and to select a country, you go ahead and click that plus icon next to it, and that adds it to the field to the left side. Uh, similarly, if you wanted to delete that country from the selected field, uh, you can go ahead and click the minus icon, and that would move Afghanistan back into the destination country field. Um, something really quick and, and not drastically important to note, but uh, you'll, you will notice that on the left side, we still have Afghanistan typed into that field. As long as you have a, a word or a country typed into that field, and it's been added to the other side, no selections will uh, will pop up. So if you want to go ahead and search for another country, you're going to have to delete that filter selection on the left side and then um, and then type in your new country or just navigate through that list of countries that are listed and added that way. Um, and then lastly, uh, something on block seven is a, is, is a bit new, um, and you'll see this throughout all of the different forms within licensing in 2.0. Um, we've we've standardized the language to, to reflect add entry. So anytime that there's a, a general entry to add on a page where you have to add, for instance, an applicant contact for additional info, um, when you click add country, it'll it, it'll pop up a new gray bar. Um, so if it's the first time, it'll have a one with applicant contact. If it's the second time, it'll say two with applicant contact. Those are entries. And so we felt like it was more important to standardize the language behind the buttons within licensing 2.0. And so we've just gone ahead and reflected it to be uh, to, to say add entry instead of the individual um, the individual information that it's uh, that it's referring to. And then if you go ahead and expand that, um, of course, we standardize the language to reflect delete entry. So the add entry and delete entry buttons uh, are, are going to be reflected throughout the entirety of licensing 2.0. Um, that was all from me in terms of the demo for uh, for what's changed. Uh, as, as mentioned before, you know, this, this new platform is going to allow us to, to build upon a lot. Um, and these, this is just the beginning of, uh, of what we're hoping to do with the licensing application. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Charlie, um, who will go over a little bit more about Dex self-service in case anybody needs a refresher. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us today. I hope um, 
based on Karen's discussion earlier and Chris's walkthrough that we just saw, um, that hopefully is, nobody is overwhelmed by anything that they saw. Our goal here with this presentation today was just to familiarize all of you with the look and feel of the changes that are coming so that when you log into the system the next time, you're not thrown off, everything looks like it's where it should be. We are still expecting the same information in our submissions as we do today. Um, this is a, a big change for us, but not hopefully a seismic shift for this group here. Um, so just a couple of reminders. Um, we're trying to provide as much information as we can, obviously here in this presentation. If you are still looking for information, the first place that we are going to direct you to is the website. So there's lots of good training material out there um, at pmddtc.state.gov. Um, we have the um, user guides, we have videos that we are looking to add to the catalog of videos here in the near future. Um, hundreds of FAQs that have posted questions and answers out there. Um, I see some of the questions coming into the chat I know are, are already out there in those FAQs and those answers are out there for you. Um, so lots of ways to get to the information um, that hopefully can get you the answers that you're looking for, you know, to make you successful when working with Index. Um, however, I realize that despite all the information um, that Chris just walked through and we've provided, um, there are still going to be some questions. So just real quick, I'm sure a lot of folks are already familiar with this, but we always want to make sure that folks know if you need help, how do I go get to it? So we'll step through that here just real quick uh, as a refresher for anybody who may be new to the system. So again, here is a look at um, the industry portal homepage. Uh, Chris started us out on earlier, um, and you'll notice the various menu op options up at the top bar there. Um, <clears throat> the upper right hand, or sorry, the upper right hand corner and the blue box there highlighted below are the two things we're going to focus on for this part of the discussion. Um, so the highlighted box down, um, it's pretty obvious hopefully what it's meant to do. The need help box, that is how you can get to create a support case or the link using the link below, view any of the cases that you have previously submitted. Uh, that information is also available to you in the box in the upper right. So that provides you um, a link to your existing support cases um, account. That little blue box there on the side shows a count of active cases, as well as if there is um, information required or the analyst is asking something of you, um, that little icon will turn red to let you know that we are looking for some more information. Um, so <clears throat> what does it look like to actually submit a case to us? Um, again, really quickly, there's an initial question here, a breakdown of which team you would like to submit your question to. Um, this is not required to get this question right. It just helps expedite the question to the right person to get you the right answer. Um, the two divisions here being our response team and our help desk. Our response team normally deals with questions about um, proper methods of doing things, uh, making sure that we're follow you're following the rules and regulations correctly, um, asking more in-depth process questions, whereas the help desk is going to be able to answer quickly those technical questions for you. So things like um, password and logon information, um, trying to get access to certain applications, those are going to be the questions you're going to direct to the help desk. And specifically, I think if you have any questions on the new look and feel of licensing 2.0, in terms of operating the fields that Chris was just walking through, the help desk is going to be your best bet to start with your question. So then once you select that, we're going to ask some, for some basic information. If you have a registration code, if you would provide it, it provides us more information as to where, where you're coming from, what organization is asking the question. Um, obviously, contact information we will be looking for. And then <clears throat> what the question of what can we help you with today? So when you start entering your question into that field, um, the system is set up to do some auto populations of answers. So as you type in the question, the system's gonna look for keywords and pull out any documents that we have stored on our website within the system that may help you answer that question. So Chris, if you go one forward, I think there's an example of a little bit more of what that looks like. So you'll be able to drop down categories, the categories will give you further subcategories based on your initial checks. And then, Chris, one more. And then here's an example of what that keyword search looks like. So you'll see there'll be some answers that'll pop up there for you automatically. So if we can provide the answer um, to the question even before it gets submitted, better for everybody, you get the answer quicker. 
um, and get keep moving with index successfully. But if not, um, then continue to type in the rest of your question. There's also an additional box there that allows for a more detailed description to give us all the information um, available so that our analysts have as much as they can to work with um, and they will get back to you with an answer very quickly. Once you have entered all the information that you need to into the form, <clears throat> go ahead and click one more forward, Chris. I think there's a little mm, submit button down at the bottom will bring you here. And this is the confirmation that you've submitted the ticket to our team. Um, you'll notice you'll get a case number there in the upper left. That is something that's always good to refer to when talking to the analyst to make sure you're talking about the correct issue. Um, if you have information to share with the analyst working the case, the fastest way to get them that information is that text box on the second lower half of the page. Um, that provides communication directly through the case management system. So the analyst has it right in front of them as soon as they go up to look for it. Um, and then again, highlighting the fact that in the upper right, the My Support Cases counter will increase by one. Um, as you go along, that number will keep track of anything that is ongoing, any questions that you have working um, with DDTC. Okay, I think that's, hopefully folks are familiar with that and comfortable using that. Um, but again, if you need help, as a reminder, make sure you use um, any of the resources that we have there on the website. On this screenshot, we're highlighting the need help section there down below. Um, the FAQ button will take you directly to those FAQs I mentioned before, and the contact us will bring folks to the customer service landing page. So again, lots of, uh, lots of tools out there for you uh, to find the answer that you need. Okay. Um, in addition, I should also point out, um, <laughs> as we have announcements and reminders, um, the website is also a good place to go for um, future events for DDTC and DEX, um, things of other conferences, speaking engagements, things that we will be involved with that you can join us at, um, where you will be able to get answers. We are posting all sorts of information, such as we were talking about earlier today. Um, officially, the release notification for licensing 2.0 will go out on the website. Um, we are also making changes to the website. We're updating the look and feel um, and modernizing the website a bit. Um, we will have a new um, release coming for that for some of the licensing pages coming in a couple of weeks. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but all of the changes and all of the things going on at DDTC will be posted there and provide lots of good information. Okay. I think I've droned on long enough. Um, just as a quick reminder, at the end of this session, it's always appreciated to get feedback on how this presentation served you. Make sure that it got you the information that you were looking for. The link is provided there, but at the, um, I believe Lisa will also be providing it in the chat. So folks who want to follow up with that link, um, it's always helpful to make sure that we're keeping these things on track. Perfect timing, Lisa, thanks much. <laughs> she just posted it in the chat, so if you go ahead and click that link and provide some feedback to us, we would appreciate it. Okay, I feel like I'm taking up time. You guys have come. We have Karen, we, were re we have the ability to answer some questions. I think we should dive into it. So um, let's get to our Q&A session. Now, the first question that we always have to ask, uh, because it's asked by multiple folks, is Renee, are we going to have a recording of this session for folks afterwards, for folks who missed it? Thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, so the the webinar recording and presentation will be posted on the census uh, website under recorded webinars. Uh, we'll put that link also in the chat. And you can also refer to DDTC's uh, website as well. We'll have a website announcement once uh, 2.0 goes live, and we'll also link uh, the webinar so you can check back and, and rewatch the recording as well. <laughs> Perfect, we always wanna make sure that this is, we are providing this as often as we can. So however anybody needs to be able to get to it, we wanna be able to get you the access. And Lisa, yep, I see, just posted the link in the chat again. So if anybody has any questions, share with your friends, share with your family, We're not shy, bring it up, bring on the audience, it's okay. Um, okay, uh, we'll go with a couple of, um, straightforward ones here. Um, Karen, I think a couple of folks have asked, we've talked about the release of licensing 2.0 is coming. Um, do we know exactly what the blackout or outage will be when we release it? Do we have that information? Yeah, so as I mentioned in my um, presentation, we're, we're doing the final go, no go 
um, this afternoon and are hoping to deploy late next week. Um, and this, we, we will likely have a longer than normal outage. Um, and so, you know, I would be looking at, um, you know, we, we may bring down licensing, um, you know, bring down the system actually um, on Thursday afternoon and, and potentially into Friday. There is a holiday um, for federal government on Monday. We do expect that, um, that, that the applications will be available um, well before that. Um, and that's sort of where we are right now. Um, and so I can't definitively say it, but that's what our planning is uh, right now, is to see if we can um, get this done before the holiday weekend um, and, and, and get, get it completely um, out there so that um, even, even on the holiday, it would be working and we would be monitoring, um, you know, as, as Charlie pointed out, there's a way for us to monitor if people are having any issues, um, even on the holiday, uh, on the holiday Monday. Um, so that, that's the plan at this point. But again, as Charlie mentioned, you're going to want to, um, keep a lookout on the website, um, and that should be coming out, um, uh, very soon if we do the go um, as opposed to the no go this afternoon. So, I mean, I would expect something tomorrow um, to come out if we're going to do that um, release next week. And then that's excellent information, Karen. I think somebody's asking a follow up question to that here um, specifically about that outage because they're asking whether or not that will impact their registration renewal. So, I think we should clarify what the, what the outage is going to impact. Yeah, and the outage is going to impact um, our licensing, our external licensing, and the registration will continue to operate. Yeah. So if you have, if you are looking to re adjust, renew, amend a registration, that will still be working. Your licenses that are in submission that are in progress will stay where they are and will await. And then once the system comes back up, they will be waiting for you when you log back in once the system comes back online. So hopefully calming fears there. All right, Chris, I'm gonna ask you this one because this one specifically has to do with the filter criteria. So I think some folks were watching that demo and their questioning is, um, if you just enter the case number, will this give you everything in the fields or do you need to enter information in all of those fields in that filter? Oh, so so we're talking about the filter criteria page on um, on track status, right? Yeah, that's I'm right. assuming. That, yeah, um, so if you enter the case number, it that's pretty much as specific as it gets for for an individual license. Uh, if you type in that case number and you press search, it will simply yield the uh, that individual license as it relates to the case number. Um, it is true, though, that if you start typing in a couple numbers or maybe uh, the, the letters GC uh, it, and just search that, it will generate all of the licenses that start with that case number, uh, those, those numbers, sorry, for the case number field. Um, but if you type in the full case number for an individual license, it will simply generate that license result. There you go. Hope that helps. Now, and for folks who do not have buckets and buckets of licenses to sort through, the track status, the view will show you all of them that you can simply scroll through them. Depending on how many you have, it might take a while. The filter criteria is just there as an assistance to sort through it, but you don't have to use it even if you don't want to. You can still get to that license just by looking through it. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, and then, Chris, another one, because I know this is a, a fun one. We get this a lot. Um, it's a digital certificate question. So with licensing 2.0, are the digital certificates going to work or do we need to do something to address that? No, they, they will definitely work. Uh, licensing two point, my, my digital certificate I've been using for, for a year now or so in, in test and, and regular environments for licensing. And since the 2.0 upgrade uh, within our test environments, um, the digital certificate on my end works perfectly. And we're, we're, our aim is to have a really seamless transition. So, so that's, that's our, that's our goal here is kind of the underscore for it is we want a seamless transition into a new, into a system that can support a lot of different enhancements and upgrades in the future and, uh, and your digital certificates will work just fine in the new environment. Perfect. And since as long as we're talking about digital certificates, Karen, did you want to did you want to talk about kind of the 
the future plans or potential that may be coming with our identity yes. thing down the road? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. This is a conversation that we've had a lot, um, both internal and external, um, you know, with the Defense Trade Advisory Group and the DEX User Group. Um, we're looking to modernize um, our identity proofing solution, not do away with digital certificates, but provide users, external users from our uh, community with an opportunity to identity proof in an alternate way. Um, you know, I found it you know, quite difficult actually to maintain our digital certs even for our own development and testing team over the pandemic. And there are um, other opportunities for us, for for example, um, folks that have PIV cards, you know, government PIV cards, you know, there's no reason why we can't configure our access management system to work with those PIV cards. And that's something that we're going to be looking into. The, the other thing I want to mention is that, um, you know, our provider for access management um, has is going to be um, authorized at the FedRAMP high level, um, high impact level, and that's where the system resides. And at that point, we are actually going to need to um, be in a position to have everyone re-enroll, which is extremely painful to imagine, um, but is really, really important. And at that point, you know, and it won't be soon, it will be likely early in 2023 that we'll need to do this. But at that point, we want to provide alternate opportunities, different ways to do authentication and identity proofing within the system. So I just wanted to bring that out. I haven't talked about that publicly. This is the first time that I'm talking about that, mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely on the roadmap for 2023. And so I just wanted to make sure you heard it here first. Perfect. The scoop, folks. <laughs> additional information coming from Candace. This is why you come to these things. This is the key. This is the frosting on this cake. Okay. Um, well, I'm Karen, if speaking of future plans, somebody did ask us a question. It's related. Um, but then the idea is if we're doing this modernization to licensing, will there be changes to other applications? Specifically, somebody's interested in the CJ model and any um, modernization of that application. Yeah, this is a this is a really good question. Of course, you know, we're on our second iteration already of the CJ application, but we do have plans to modernize the CJ application, make it much easier for people to submit those applications. Um, it is on our roadmap. Um, it is one of the, um, and, and we're going to do the same with advisory opinions as well. That that was a very early on, I think, 2017 deployment. Um, so both of those applications will be using the same framework. And of course, disclosures, which is, is right now not even in the platform, um, also using the same uh, look and feel, the exact same um, way of doing things um, so that it's really frictionless for you to go in and, and you can add countries the same way. You can, you know, drop down USML the same way um, just so that you have a common experience um, for, for all these different applications. So that's a great yeah. question. Thanks, Charlie. And for the, for the person that answer, asked it, thank you so much. And now, and this one's a little more specific, Karen, and I've got to ask it because it came rapid fire twice from two different people is, are there any plans to allow for a DSP 83 to be electronically signed? Is that part of, or in the works? Um, that's a that's a really good question too. That yeah. is not yet in our roadmap, um, and you know I don't know. I mean I don't see that as something that we're going to do in the near term. Um, and a lot of these these enhancements are going to take time. Um, you know, so I I don't I, I can't speak directly to when we would allow that um, because there's there's a lot of pent up demand, believe it or not, um, from internal users, um, which is unusual in a normal situation, but because of the pandemic and everyone teleworking, we got enormous internal demand for additional services. So we're trying to, you know, work both the internal requirements and the external requirements, of course, simultaneously and and make sure that, that we have most of our core applications um, working well and, and all the rest of it. And like I said, the 83 is, um, is lower on our priority list and not on our roadmap at this point. Yeah. Volume has to dictate some of that work, right? Just. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was excellent. Thanks, Karen. 
Um, Chris, another one just to clarify, I've seen this come in a couple of times. So um, folks are, we saw the copy feature for the license. So officially previous license before in licensing 1.0, can we be using that to copy forward to two point? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. No, Karen. Karen, you go right ahead. <laughs> no, no. Go. You go, Chris. <laughs> Everybody's excited to talk about. It. We all want to make sure we know. Uh, well, like Karen mentioned in in her portion of the presentation, uh, all of your in progress applications are going to carry over. So anything that is currently in progress or that was uh, that was in progress prior to two point of deployment. Uh, you'll be able to use any of the features we have within the environment uh, perfectly fine as if as if nothing ever happened. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. All right, so this is going to be a little unfair. I gave Chris the fun one, Karen. I'm going to give you the less fun one. Okay. We've got a couple of questions, though, asking about some licenses that may have been in the system a while. Um, they are still in review. Is there a good way to find out what's going on with those, where they are in the pipeline? How do how do folks find out more about those? Well, that's a good question, Charlie. And and you know, it's not a great answer actually, but um, you know, it's uh, our colleagues over at DITSA do have a system called ELISA, where all the information that is going to be available through any of the systems is in terms of, you know, what the status is. And, and we are hoping, we are working with um, our interagency partners over at DITSA to be able to get that information to feed it through DEX. But at this point, we don't have all of the status information. So it just says review. And sometimes it can be, it can take a long time um, for the interagency review and, and and really the most information that is that is available to you is in this ELISA system. Now um, there is a link to the ELISA system within DEX. Um, so you can actually sort of seamlessly get into that system. Um, it'll take you over to their website um, and to their interface. Um, and that was a that was an improvement that we made. Um, post deployment, um, I think in 2020 or 2021, based on some um, user feedback from the DEX user group. Yeah, and I think I think folks are are jumping on that topic too. Kind of seeing a couple of questions come in about will there be more status information available as we go forward? Not necessarily in licensing 2.0, but as the system continues to improve and evolve, is that something that is also on the you know the roadmap somewhere along the way? Uh, that's a really good question too. I, you know, I don't know if we're going to have more information uh, necessarily, but I do know that I'm interested in making sure that we, um, for example, with, you know, right now we we are sending over, um, you know, an XML file with a PD, you know, it's on, it's in a PDF, um, you know, for the license itself. And from what I've learned from the feedback, from from individual companies um, who have reached out to me directly and from the DEX user group, it would be really helpful to have um, this data come in in a way that they can send it off to their freight forwarder or, you know, that it's not just in a PDF, which is really reminiscent of really a paper process. And we're all trying to get away from the paper process and make our processes more digital. And so the idea of providing status um, and and licenses um, through an API through an automated programming interface is something that's really high on my priority list. Um, you know, just beyond you know, sort of the retooling of the of the user interface and the um, and the authentication for for security purposes, because this will make the experience of getting a license um, much simpler for industry. And I think it's it's really. Um, you know, a, a big issue um, of, you know, just not a frictionless process because if you're getting a PDF and then, and then, you know, you, you really want to be able to get it into your system um, so that you can very effectively um, push it out so that the shipment can actually happen if it's, um, you know, if it's hardware. Yeah. I know it may seem like we are, we are adding to the friction sometimes, but that is, that is intentional. But it's not our goal. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not intentional. Um, right, it is. right. And um, it is. You know, I, I, and and you know some of the other things that we're trying to do, frankly, is to 
is to share data more rapidly with CBP and and they have done a lot of work in making sure that when we send over data that it's that it's instantly available um, also looking at ways to just do more automation in terms of that so that there is no lag time between um, an authorization and and it getting over to CBP because there's there's no need for there to be um, lag time. It's just we we've, we've got to get better about transferring data um, and and doing more automation on that front. And it's it's complicated by this from the standpoint that these are in two different environments. There's a uh, the DITSA system is on the um, classified network and and um, so so there's that complication. But we're trying to reduce the amount of time that it takes um, for these authorized licenses to get over to CBP. Yeah. That's perfect. Thank you, Karen. And I think on that, I think that's going to be our big last question because I, I just have a few more admin things to mention here um, as we wrap up. Um, so folks have been asking in the chat specifically about the outage window again in terms of when it's going to start, when it's going to stop, what's going to be down. So again, right. I will just refer everybody back to the website so that like Karen has been saying, once we know, once we have that official information, we will post it as soon as we've got it locked in and you guys will have that information front and center on the website. So there will be no questions about what's still going to be available. And again, as a oh, sorry, go ahead, Karen. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, after I answered the registration question about that, not that that would still be available, um, it occurred to me that they share a database and there's many database changes. So we are going to have registration and licensing down. Um, and if there are issues um, with that, um, because we're doing it during the week, it would be, you know, it would be good to know um, by, and what I would, what I would request is that, is that you submit that through self-service um, that Charlie um, identified earlier in the presentation. Um, if there's going to be a problem with a particular registration that needs to be able to be submitted, and we can um, review that and consider that in, in creating our timeline. Yep, absolutely. And we definitely, you know, we were trying to give folks as much information as we can here, as much heads up. Um, we will not suddenly turn around in 20 minutes to go turn off the system on everybody. So we will try to give folks fair warning that this is coming. So you're not going to be surprised um, that you suddenly can't get into Dex. So, all right. With that, um, Wendy, do we still have you? Because I have, I have one last wrap up question as we end here. Um, somebody just wanted to make sure they had the information from your intro slides as well. So if you had the ability to point people in the right direction, I'm assuming to the census website, but if you had some more specifics that you wanted to add to that. Um, I think the link has been provided in the chat. Lisa, if you could post that Census Academy site um, where they can access the materials and give us about seven to 10 days and we'll have it posted. Hmm. And all of the other census information that Wendy talked about is also available through that site. Um, so you'll find, be able to find all the information in the recording and be able to find your way there to get to sure. all that info. Sure, yes. Um, the data tool as well are also listed there. Are there okay. any other questions, Charlie? I think we are at time. So I think with that. Okay. Well, this has been up. a Great um, webinar, and, and Charlie, I think in addition to the frosted cake, I think they received some ice cream along along with this today as well. Great so. presentation, um, lively questions that came in through the chat, and, and also um, flattering comments on the presentation. So just want to remind you all that are still on the call today, we had um, over 800 that was in attendance, and it's a little over 600 that are still on the call today. So just please, please complete the evaluation. Um, we want to hear back from you. Um, if there's content that we haven't presented, um, just let us know and we will try to offer it for you. And thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. This completes the webinar. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.